Uh, I'm Pastor Corey. If we haven't met, we would love to meet. This is my wife, Pastor Erin. Uh, we would love to meet you uh, in the lobby after. Um, and t- uh, today is a special day as well. Um, there's pizza with pastors. So uh, that's after the next service. And so uh, come back at 1245 or just stick around because um, it's always a little bit different. So I was telling somebody on my team, I'm like, I don't know what's going to happen. And we planned most of this. And so, um, so it's a wonderful thing about this church and what God is doing here. And so, um, so that is, I think as of yesterday, I think we had just about 60 people signed up for that. So why don't you just come along? It's going to be easy to come to. It's not going to be just you. And so, um, can I also say like a huge thank you? They're probably not even in the building, but thank you to the parking lot team in the middle of winter. We love you guys. They get here for the early service and you get here with a bad attitude because it's winter and you forgot that we live in Canada. And uh, they're just like, greet you with a smile. And so high, f- high five somebody, roll your window down, let the heat out on a parking lot person and high five them on the way by. Um, yeah, so, and uh, yeah. Also, as the family increases, I want to say it would be easy for you. I'm not going to tell you which service to go to, but as you can see, it's like full. And the next one is probably like going to be like rafter full. But um, if you happen to get up early, we have a service that starts at 830. And next week is like a freebie because you get to sleep in for an hour. And I'm just like, sacrifice that costs you nothing, which is what most people are looking for. And so I'm just saying, if you wanted to try the early service, it just makes a little more room sometimes. So I'm just saying. But it's great that you're here. Um, Did you hear our uh, new sound system this morning? Oh, my goodness. Actually, the decibel level has gone down because the quality can go up so much. And so normally I would sit here and just get blown away by subwoofers. So I had no idea what anybody was singing or saying on the stage just because our system, we've been waiting for 13 months. You paid for it 13 months ago, everybody. So, so thank you for your generosity. We just get to worship God with the best stuff, you know. So it's going to take us a little while to dial it in, but it's going to be great. Also, you may not know this. We gave our, our old sound system. Like, I mean, like four giant subwoofers and everything. We gave it to Footprint School next door because we need their parking. <laughs> so we're just like, hey, we love you guys. Just like, don't forget about us. And uh, here's like a bunch of thousands of dollars of free stuff just to bless uh, somebody in the city. And they were actually, if you don't know, before we were here, we rented their facility. And we just have a great relationship with them. And thank God for their parking because you get here and you get a parking spot there. But our entire dream team parks over there so that you have a parking spot here. And so, uh, yeah. That could be you, actually. You could come to Pizza with Pastors and join the Dream Team. And also park with the fun people. All the Corvettes are over there, guys. I tried to get our bookkeeper to be like, do we have enough in the budget for a venue Corvette? Mostly for myself. The answer was no. Okay. Um, also, what are you guys doing uh, Wednesdays, like, say, 7 o'clock or so? First Wednesday? That's a night of worship and ministry and just a powerful night that goes way behind the scenes here that you're going to uh, want to be at. If you ever come, you always come to every, every one after that because you can't afford to miss it. It's just um, so good. So, All right, my next series I'm going to be preaching because we're at the end of Frank and Jesus. My next series uh, is going to be called The Power Plant. Now, this is a series about the Holy Ghost. Let's go Old Testament. Let's go King James Version, the Holy Ghost. Now, if I was the devil, and I'm not, If I was the devil and I couldn't keep you away from Jesus, I couldn't keep you from becoming a Christ follower. I couldn't keep you from becoming adopted into God's family. I would keep you away from the Holy Spirit if I could, because I would keep you um, what I call a Christian civilian. And they're the Christians that annoy you the most. They're the ones with all the opinions and all the things and all the... I would keep you out of the war that you're already in. I would take the weapons away from you. And the Holy Spirit has given us weapons. I'm going to do four parts on the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. And also I'm going to do a bonus uh, episode uh, that is always requested about like, uh, let's talk about them speaking in tongues. Because that's a little freaky, the whole speaking in tongues thing. So I'm going to actually cover it. Um, So I know that, you know, your dad was freaked out or wasn't or was a charismaniac. Uh, Wherever you come from, we're actually just going to look at the Bible. And uh, go from there and see what the Holy Spirit has to share uh, with us. Okay. Today's sermon, thank you, Sean, is called, this is Sean, my accountability partner. If you want to know any of the dirt on my life, just talk to Sean. Um, today's sermon is called Frank and Jesus, part three. We've been talking about a Frank and Jesus that you and I create because the real Jesus can be kind of mean sometimes. Um, 
but Frank and Jesus can't save you. And so we create this other version of God that, that we like that's a little bit easier for us to, to, to swallow, um, but it's not really God at all. In fact, it loses uh, that Frank and Jesus, it will lose the power of the Lord in your life because um, it's not actually Jesus. I feel like some people here haven't heard the other two in the series. Just go back and listen to them. I really explain that. Now, um, today's sermon is called Not a Negotiation. So Jonah... Even Jonah creates a Frank and Jesus, and this is before Jesus was even born. Jonah the prophet, you remember the guy in the whale? Okay, or the big fish. So Jonah, God, here's God's message. Hey, go, I want you to save uh, the worst city on the planet. I, wanna, I want you to go there, and I want you to preach a message so they can repent. So say, like, I want you to go to Edmonton <laughs> and, like, preach a sermon, and I want them to repent because I'm going to wipe that city out. It is so wicked against... I'm just, I was born in Edmonton. I'm just kidding. So... so and, and Jonah, he does what we do sometimes. We negotiate by fight or by flight, you know, kind of however you're made, right? And so he just like, he's like, I'm out. I hate those guys. I'm not going to do it. Uh, so that's where this is going today. Now, I like a good negotiation. Um, I like a good negotiation. I love. If we're having trouble with somebody or somebody in the city or we're trying to like build a building like we're doing here or something, I'm just like, just get me in the room with them. I am charming. I, w- I can sell ice to Eskimos. I can, I, I love selling stuff. I don't even know what I'm selling sometimes. I just love it. But if I get onto something, you know, there was a show that we were watching um, that, that actually Sean and Nassia started watching. And then Nassia told us for a year. And then I watched it one time and I'm like, oh my goodness, everybody's got to watch this show. And they did. And Nassia hated me forever. But I'm like, that's what I do. I'm just like, y'all got to watch this show. This is, I'm the first person to watch it. And she's like, I've been talking about this for a whole year. I'm like, you got to work in your sales pitch. And so I love a good negotiation. Now, my mom, you know, Pastor Beth, she's retired now, mom and dad, but we still call them pastors out of respect. Now, my mom, uh, I was good at selling my mom stuff. One time I had my mom all talked into it, and then she said the words that I didn't want to hear as a child because there's always one parent that you could talk to, right? And then the other one that says no. So my mom was like the, it's possible. And so I had her talked into it. And she's like, that sounds pretty good. And then she says, why don't you ask your dad? And I said, no. And she said, why? It sounded pretty good. And I'm like, he's never going to go for that, mom. Oh, my goodness. Uh, My dad one time, I, I, I walked into the room. I had a sales pitch already. I walked into the room, and I took a deep breath. And I'm like, dad. And he looked over, and he said, no. I wasn't, I was one word into the negotiation and that was all as far as I got. Now, um, I took dad's church over in a small town, Pastor Aaron and I did, um, North here. We came here about six years ago, so we're going to turn seven. We're a big boy church now. So, um, pretty quick here. Um, but so, but before that I took dad's church over for a couple of years in a small town and then we felt God wanted us to move here and plant this. And so we came with about 30 people that most of whom are still with us and, Bought houses for $100,000 more. Thank you, guys. The same house some of them bought here for $100,000 more. That's how much they care about the city. And so um, so I had this church building there that was all paid off. And I'm like, I don't know who to sell this to because the way it was owned and where it was right in the middle of residential, I can't sell it. So I'm like, I could sell it to a funeral home, but nobody, you know, that's depressing. And so I'm like, I can sell it to a funeral home, but nobody wanted it there. It was a bigger building there. And, or I could sell it to, then I'm like, I have nobody else to sell this to. So I took the, the mayor out and the CFO or whatever, the, the money guy out, bought them $65 of the worst steak sandwiches I'd ever had. Because here was the problem with selling them this building. They had the, the city hall and the library beside each other. Now I knew they wanted to expand the library. So I'm like, so they need to figure out an, a building for city hall. And I'm like, I'll bet you I could sell them the church for city hall. The, the trouble is this is downtown and the church was way over here, not downtown at all. And who has a city hall that's not downtown, right? So I'm like, Lord, I need a sales pitch. So I took these guys out. This is my sales pitch. Are you ready? And it. I'm like, you know, guys, I know that it's not down, downtown, but maybe there's some advantages to that. Like here, I'm at the grocery store picking up milk. I should complain about my taxes. You know, it's like I'm at the library picking up a book. Maybe I should complain about my taxes. And I'm like, at least they'd have to drive to. Yeah. They shouldn't have bought that building, but they did. 
And we took the cash, uh, about half of that cash we took, the other, uh, the other just less than half we gave to my mother and father just to help them retire a little bit. We're not talking about piles of money, but just to, like, they give their lives to the church. They, this is the foundation of what they built, actually. And so we're like, hey, we need to take care of you just as much as we can. And then we took the other cash and came here and planted because, like, adoption costs money. And, look, we can meet under a tree if you want to. There's no, like, expense for, like, lights or power or stuff down there, but... You're not coming in the middle of winter, so, and your neighbor's not coming, more importantly. And so, um, I don't know how I got off on that. Anyways, so the long and short story is I'm a great salesman. Um, (laughs) My daughter, Neela, is like next level sales. Have you ever met Neela? Neela sold, Neela has been addicted to coffee since before she was five. She's our fourth girl, and I know what you're thinking, like, oh, you're bad parents. Shut up. (laughs) If you don't have four kids, shut up. Nobody cares what you think. If you don't have any kids at all, nobody really cares what you think. (laughs) Like, well, that's not the way that I would. You're not doing anything right now. You wait and see what sleep deprivation does to your brain. So she but this is her sales pitch. She comes along and she's like, she's like four. And mom's mom's drinking coffee. And she's like, Mom, can I have some coffee? And mom's like, baby, coffee's not for little girls. She's like, okay. And just walks away. Then a few minutes later, she comes back. Mom, can I have some coffee? No, baby, coffee's not for little girls. Mom, a few minutes later, I'm going to have some coffee. Not upset, not angry. She didn't go take the coffee. She just like, you know what got her that coffee? Here's the deal. Like, it's like the millionth time. I'm like, yeah, can I have some coffee? And then she says this. Then she says this. This is the kicker. You want to sell something? Like, just a little bit. (laughs) I'm like, ah, sure. What's a little bit? A little bit's not going to stunt your growth. Look, we're copes. We're not going to be tall anyway, so you might as well drink some coffee. Make, drink some coffee. Make a man out of you, you know. That was my parents' thing. <laughs> Little did I know the school system was going to try that anyways. But, okay, I know. Cheap shots. Whatever, whatever. Okay, whatever. All right. Why do we negotiate? Why do we negotiate? Why do we negotiate? Because here's, here's why. I was asking the Holy Spirit, so how do I get, how do I, how do I, think about this. Why do we negotiate? And I feel like this is kind of the answer is that we negotiate with humans all the time because, because we're afraid. And it might be true that there's that in this regard, that, that this is what we're afraid of. We're afraid that there's not enough to go around and we're not going to get ours. So it's like, We know that in this thing here at work or in my home, there's not enough love to go around or money to go around or promotions to go around. So I'm going to go and try to get mine before somebody else takes it all. So our negotiation is based on a very real human fear that there's not enough to go around because no human on the other side of that table is, uh, let's say it like this. No human is like our God. Our father in heaven is smart enough powerful enough, has all the things, has all the love you need and the healing and the food and the, he's got everything, but we can't trust humans. Even if they did have all this stuff to distribute it to a place where our needs would be met and everybody's needs would be met at the same time. In every conflict, there's like somebody gets something and somebody gets messed up, but not with God. See with God, he is the only being capable of giving everybody everything that they need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Doesn't mean it's not going to hurt. Doesn't, but he will supply all of your need. That is what he has said. He has never broken a promise ever. So we take this like scarcity mindset and then we bring it into God and we're like, Hey, there's not enough love. There's not enough sexual satisfaction. So I'm just going to go and get this now. I'm going to negotiate. And God's like, Whoa, 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 Whoa. If everybody would do what I would say, I would take care of everybody because I can and nobody else can. I feel like sometimes uh, church people want a pastor whose job, who's there to negotiate with God to get them stuff. You know, like, here's my Christmas list. Can you pray about this? And I'm like, some of this is weird. Really? 
like to negotiate, like, hey, represent us to God so that you can get us stuff or get us healed or get us when really my job is to represent God to you because he's already planned to do the things. He just wants you in a place of obedience so that you're not going to misuse the blessing of the Lord, right? So, um, some of y'all are negotiating the sermon right now. I was like the best sermon negotiator. My dad was my pastor and he'd be preaching and I'd be like arguing in my brain with him. I even knew he was right and I'd still argue just because I like to argue. And so finally God tells me like, you know, if you just shut up and say yes before he says anything, we could speed up your spiritual growth a little bit. Like he's preaching out of the word of God. So what are we arguing about? Why don't you just do? And I realized in that moment, my Christianity went up a whole different level into effectiveness because I finally stopped arguing with everything that I already knew I should just be doing. Negotiation. God doesn't negotiate ever. And I know that, okay, so let's talk about Abraham because I just preached about him with Sodom and Gomorrah. You're like, yeah, but he negotiated like the price of Sodom and Gomorrah. God's like, okay, I'm not going to wipe these idiots out. Now, it's easy for you in Canada to be like, oh, well, God seems so harsh. I'm like, you don't know what people used to do to people. And people are still doing to people in the earth unless you come from there. So an unjust God is also an unloving God. So there is a God of punishment and correction. Like, thank God or this world would, whoever's got the gun gets everything he wants, right? Or she. So, or she. Girls can be crazy too. Okay. It's mostly guys we get about. You're like, what about Abraham? Because he negotiated God from 50 righteous people, then he wouldn't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah down to 10. And I'm like, no, Abraham, okay, a negotiation is trying to get something for you or trying to get away with something for you. This is the difference that I would love you to make a shift in your life today because you are naturally a negotiator because Canadians are negotiators, right? We sit in the middle and we're just like, okay, well, you know, like just a little bit. Um, God wants you to not stop negotiating with heaven and start, are you ready? Abraham didn't negotiate, he mediated. Complete difference there. He went between God and, and them. See, a mediator will take it on themselves to set other people free or to see that they're not destroyed. There was nothing in that for Abraham. Yeah. Nothing at all. Yeah. It's just like God's going to wipe them out or not wipe them out. Now God still wiped them out because he couldn't even find 10 people there. But through Abraham, see, God needs a human mediator on the earth. Wow. Why do you think Jesus came? It's you're like, well, why doesn't God just fix all the problems in the world? Because God gave the world to humans and he's not going to take it back until the end of all things. So he gave you a gift and you're like, well, I wish that God wouldn't have done that. It's like you wanted to be a robot. That's the only way that he can make sure that you didn't screw the world up yeah. is make you a robot. No, we're humans. It's just the way it's gravity. Nobody complains about that. It hurts us sometimes, the heat of the stove. It can bake cookies or it can burn your hand if you're a two-year-old Corey and your mom told you not to and you're just like, what's up? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Nobody complains about that. So this is just how the world is made. So God is looking for a human mediator. They're like, didn't Jesus come down? That's why Jesus came down and was fully man and fully God. But he was born of a woman because he needed a human mediator in the human condition. That's why the local church is the hope of the world. Because you're like, well, why doesn't God just come and fix everything? Because he gave it away. The only thing that we can, he can fix is what we give back. So stop getting angry at God for breaking the world. That's the devil, everybody. It's the devil. Hate the devil. Don't hate God for giving you a choice and letting you decide what you want to do. So, so Jesus comes down. You're like, didn't he come to negotiate terms with us and God? Not at all. He came, you ready, to pay for all of your sins, right. past, present, future sins. He came because God was coming to judge the earth, and somebody had to pay the ticket, and somebody had to die because the wages of sin is death. And he's like, I don't want John to have to pay it. I'm going to pay it right. for him. God turns his face away from Jesus on the cross. That, what that is meaning is like you were adopted at a price. Jesus unadopted himself so that you could be grafted in. That was the cost. And then you're like, but I got to come to God and what do I have to give him? This is God's deal. Give me all of you, which sucks. And I'll give you all of me, which doesn't. And you're like, that seems expensive. And he's like, why are you kidding me? I don't know if God like yells stuff, but. 
we get uh, negotiating emails every now and again to the church. And look, we're not trying to waste anybody's time. Here's an email we got. I know that they're not here because of our response. <laughs> we need wisdom for all of these things too because, I mean, yeah. we get hung for something that didn't even happen these days, you know. It doesn't have to be true to be believed. I don't know if you know this about society. So this is an email we got. Like, I'm looking for a Bible-believing church. And then let me just paraphrase. But I'm sleeping around and I don't want to hear about it. I'm like, okay, God is like, okay, sexual promiscuity is going to hurt everybody, including yourself. Don't do it. It's called a sexual practice. It's not how God made you. It's what you've been practicing. I was born this way. Babies are not born having sex, everybody. It's just the dumbest thing in the world right now. I'm like, no, you learned it somewhere. You did it. You looked at it. You're like, what? No, oh my goodness. I was born to be, a, you know, I'm an electrician by trade. I was born an electrician. I'm like, that's scary. No. Okay, so I'm just helping you think about things. Here's this email. So the email basically says, I'm looking for a Bible-believing church that doesn't believe the Bible. Like, what do you want me to say? What do you believe about sexuality? The Bible. Like, I don't know how to, like, make it easier for you. The Bible. We don't think anything else works. The Bible. Frank and Jesus is like moving in with your stepdad who lets you eat ice cream and stay up all night. He doesn't care where you go. He doesn't care if you're home at a certain time or take the trash out. He loves trash building up in the house. He'll smoke weed with you. Only Frank and Jesus smokes weed with you. I'm not kidding. Only Frank and Jesus goes out and gets loaded with you and does whatever, whatever. Like, oh, no, just all the pain. You know what real Jesus will do? Let's talk about the pain. Let's get in there. I don't want you broken and crippled. You liked that, didn't you? The smoking weed part. <laughs> Jesus is not going to sit there and smoke weed with you while you, like, tell everybody how smart you are. I don't know if this makes sense, but when you smoke weed, you get stupid. You just think you're smart. And real Jesus doesn't think you're smart. He's just like, dude, you got to, like, get that junior high kid out of there. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. Thanks for preaching the truth. Can I talk to you about last, uh, last weekend? Um, pastor Peter and Carolyn, there are pastors in Minneapolis. We're just with them. And, and pastor Carolyn sucker punched me last Saturday. So she had said this, like, Hey, you know, I, I've heard bits and pieces of your marriage story and our marriage. I mean, it was a, a real dark, right? So, so she's like, she asked pastor and like, I want to hear your story. So send me an email about it. And I'm like, okay, like you do that. That's great. And then Aaron lets me know that, that Pastor Carolyn wanted, she's like, I want to hear from you too. And I found out about this on Saturday afternoon. And I'm like, that wasn't part of the deal. So last weekend, we baptized 33 people. Public profession of faith. Incredible weekend. We were... Not, not that I super care ab about numbers, but we were nine short of a thousand, which means nine of you didn't invite your friends. <laughs> listen, listen, church was great for you. You know what I'm thinking about? Because Saturday afternoon, all of a sudden, all the pressure and the, my body is preparing itself for trauma to go back because every time we've ever gone back, we just about didn't come out. And I mean, there's some deep stuff in there and I'm just like... <sighs> We're baptizing people. I'm like loving what God is doing. And on the other side, I'm like, I'm in this, you know what I'm in a decision of? Do I start a negotiation with her? Do I decide what I'm going to share and what I'm not? Do I try to get her to think about me a certain way? Because it's so dark and confusing and it, it's just going to sound crazy. And it was. I'm like, what do I do? Monday I get up, supposed to be my day off. I'm not sleeping. I'm back in like weird dreams and, and I can feel the pressure just slamming up in my head, you know, and I'm like, so Monday morning I came here. I should be just like enjoying my day and kind of, it's my Sabbath. I've, and uh, so I just came to the church here and I just wrote it up and I'm like, you know what? I just decided not to negotiate. I'm just like, here we are. This is, this is who we are. Please like us. 
Only Frank and Jesus negotiates. Real Jesus doesn't. See, there becomes two versions of Jesus in your life. One of them is actually Jesus. I don't know how it gets mixed in a person's soul, but it does. And then one is Frank and Jesus. He just starts by like, can I just have a corner of your mind? Like, you're, you know, your spouse doesn't treat you right or doesn't give you what you need. So like, let's just take a corner. But sooner or later, it becomes like a musical thrones thing going on. A musical chair is like, okay, like Jesus is here at church, but then we go out and then we're with the guys tomorrow and it's Frank and Jesus who's cool with sex jokes. You know, I'm just like, we just start mixing up as like, well, part of our finances are, are godly, but part of them just aren't. And, and uh, it's just selfish. And, and then what happens after we get two versions of Jesus is there become two versions of you. Now, this is where your soul starts to, like, mix and split. It's this weird thing that happens where, where you become different versions of you with different people. And then you got to remember who are you, what did you say. Judge Judy's like, you got to have a good memory because you become a liar. And you're, like, not really you anywhere. And then you become very confused. And it's very hard because you don't know who you are anymore. And you're, like, feel like a hypocrite. And, but you're with this group and with that. And you're not yourself anywhere. You're just not honest and open anywhere. One of you loves Jesus. And the other one made a deal with something else. That can stop today. Don't go down that path. Why do you think we went down in the dark? In our marriage and our family. Two versions of Jesus, two versions of us. Just, just be one. Just be who you are and let the Lord deal with the mess. Yeah. Jonah, it says the Lord gave this message to Jonah. He said, get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and announce my judgment against it because I've seen how wicked its people are. So this is not Jonah's first assignment. This is a big deal. This is like the biggest assignment on earth at the time. So he's already like been in the employ of God for a long time. He's a prophet of God. So he's saying like, hey, I need you to mediate or I'm going to have to wipe these guys out. It's like 120,000 people, I think, if my numbers are right. I should have checked that out. A lot of people. He's like, it's Airdrie and a half, and I'm going to wipe them out. Now, he says he got up and went in the opposite direction. <laughs> I like this, to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa. He found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket, went on board, hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing on a sea God made to a city God made <laughs> in, a, in a boat whose wood God grew. You know, I mean, like... Let's run away from the Lord. You can run away from church, but you can't run from the Lord. Don't run away from church. I think that's a bad idea, too. But now, before you get angry at Jonah, um, Google, and don't let your kids do it, Google 7th century Assyrian violence. Because I saw, like, stone tablets with, like, depictions of what they did to people. And I didn't, I had bad dreams all week. Because it's, scary as heck like you don't think humans can do that well you don't think it because you were born here but we got rwandans in the house and like oh yeah when the devil gets a hold of people the devil had these guys and it was crazy i mean crazy and if i was jonah honestly because they would conquest into israel and so like his life would be directly personally affected by these crazy insane violent people that would come and i don't even want to tell you what they did and he's hurt and he's angry. And he's like, I think you should kill him. And you think that too. And everybody on the planet would be like, kill those guys. They're crazy. But the Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. See, because Jonah goes in the opposite direction. God's like, Jonah, I have a plan here that you don't even know about. You've got to get over your hurt and forgive because I have something else in play that's so much big, bigger than your life. See, the trouble with why, why we create a Frank and Jesus and why we won't forgive and why we can't do the hard things is because you're just thinking about you. And there is a leverage that will get you healthy, but not into the deep stuff. Can I just say this? Until you start to love people more than you love yourself. Like, you got to love yourself. Don't get me wrong. But when you love people... More than, you know, it's better to give than to receive. I mean, this, this beauty, uh, up is down and left is right. It's a beautiful Jesus thing. Because Jesus loved you more than he loved himself on the cross. He was thinking about you. And 
and he runs from the Lord. And now all these sailors are involved, and fearing for their lives, this storm, the desperate sailors shouted to their gods for help and threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. I'm just like, but yeah, that's not happening in Canadian culture right now. I'm like, everything's going down. Just throw everything over the side and hope that it floats, you know? I'm just like, oh my goodness. But all this time, Jonah was sound asleep down in the hold. Do we have anybody here who can panic sleep? Can you? Pastor Aaron, like straight up, we'll be in the middle of an argument and I'll look over and she's gone. She's like, I, I'm not going to admit I'm wrong, so I'm just going <laughs> to go to sleep. How come you guys are all emotionally on her team? I want to know that. You don't even know. Some of us are spiritual fainting goats. That's one pet I could get behind. I want a fainting goat for when church people are just, I just want to go out to my yard and just slam the door and just. Hey. Look, a fainting, spiritual fainting goat is not much threat to the devil. And Jonah's just like, I'm going to sleep. And, you know, the hell with these guys. So the captain went down. How can you sleep at a time like this? Get up and pray to your God. Maybe he'll pay attention and spare our lives because you're not paying any attention to us. Like, thanks for all the help, Jonah. This is like the guy who lifts a piano that doesn't actually lift anything. You know that guy. He just makes all the noise. Like, eh, look at me. And we're like, you're not actually you're not even holding anything. <laughs> then the crew cast lots to see which of them offended the gods and caused a terrible storm. So this is what they used to do. They used to roll the dice. When they did this, the lots identified Jonah as the culprit. So this is just like a... You know what I'm saying? <laughs> You're like, God can help my gambling? I'm like, no. <laughs> Frank and Jesus. Frank and Jesus. But this identified Jonah. I mean, this was a casting of the lots. That's exactly what it was, like a throwing of the dice. Why is this awful storm come down on us? They demanded, who are you? What's your profession? I'm like, what a weird, like, what's your line of work? What do you do for a living? I'm like, in that moment, I'm like, I don't care what you do for, like, what? what? But watch. Not that he answers that. <laughs> I'm a prophet of the God. <laughs> what country are you from? What is your nationality? He goes, I'm a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. And the sailors were terrified when they heard this, for he had already told them he was running away from the Lord. <laughs> I'm like, oh, why did you do it? Like, what are you, what? Like, where does that come up in conversation? <laughs> like, why are you going to Tarshish? Work. <laughs> why are you going to Tarshish? Like, oh, it's grandma's birthday, you know. We're going to the beach. Yeah. Why are you going? I'm like, I'm running for the Lord. <laughs> the God who made the sea that we're on. Like. <laughs> Since the storm was getting worse all the time, they asked him, what should we do to you to stop the storm? Throw me into the sea. Watch this. Just dig in. Throw me into the sea, Jonah said, and it will become calm again. I know this terrible storm is all my fault. Here's what I want to say. Here's what I want to say. When you go to Frank and Jesus, your fight or flight, you're just trying to get away from the Lord. Why would you make somebody else do your dirty work for you? You literally want these guys to be plagued every night until they die by the prophet of the Lord that they threw overboard. Because he didn't have the guts to tip himself overboard. Can I say this? Okay, your dad hurt you when you were young. Why does your husband have to pay for it? Go to the Lord Jesus, sign up for Freedom Group, get counseling, get help, and get well. This is not something like, do your own dirty work. This, you're not happy. Nobody else can make you happy except the Lord. Come and get right in the sight of the Lord. There is enough healing in him. He can snap his fingers and heal it all. But you got to do the work for free. Now the Lord arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah. He was inside the fish for three days and three nights. I was like, thank you, Pastor Carol. Saturday night, Sunday night. Okay. Watch this. Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I have given you. God doesn't speak the next thing till you do the last thing. And that's why some of you are like, God hasn't said anything in a long time. I'm like, what's the last thing he told you to do? Look, some of us, can I just say this? Like some of us like go from church to church because by the time we get to a church, it takes a few years and all of a sudden God brings us the same problem up that you didn't want to deal with last time. And he's like, it's time to deal with this thing. And then we just like, I'm just going to go down to Tarshish in a boat. And I'm going to run away from the Lord. And I'm going to go to a different pastor. And then you showed up here and this one's super mean. 
and preaches about Jonah. And I'm like, hey, you don't have to carry that baggage around forever. Let's go. Let's get better. Let's get healthy. Let's get into our destiny. Now, the people of Jonah believe God's message from the greatest to the least. Watch this. Like, this is like a prophet's dream. And they declared a fast and put on burlap to show their sorrow. Now, that's if you're sorrowful, like, get a potato sack and let's go. Then the king and the noble sent this decree throughout the city. No one, not even animals from your herds and flocks may eat or drink anything at all. You know what he did? You know what he did? Listen, you're already serving another God. Take all that energy and serve this one. Take all that energy that you've been spending inventing violence and try to keep that cow from eating grass. That's what they did. Like, take all the energy and like, stop that dog from drinking. Stop it. What are you doing? I'm talking about this. If we don't, we all going to die, including them. We got to do something drastic because this is crazy. People and animals, this is the decree, must wear garments of mourning. Wow. <laughs> Tell your wife, she, potato sack, let's go. My wife had an a orphan Annie dress that looked like a potato sack one time. And I'm like, you got to stop wearing that thing around. And then we got married and she trots this thing out. And I'm like, you didn't wear that while we were dating. <laughs> and this is like orphan Annie dress. She's like, I like it. It's so comfy. I'm like, it looks comfy. <laughs> it went missing. I don't know what happened to that thing. <laughs> And everyone must pray earnestly to God. They must turn from their evil ways and stop all their violence. Who can tell? Maybe perhaps even the Lord, yet God will change his mind and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. When God saw that what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. He had compassion because he had a mediator. Who is God trying to save through your life? I know the message is hard. I know you're going to go to a hostile place. I know you're going to wake up and go to work tomorrow. I know you're going to walk into a family environment that's hostile. Who does God want to save if you would only mediate? It's not about you. It's not just about you. This change of plans greatly upset Jonah, and he became angry. Very angry. The Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry about this? Remember now, like, I'm not angry with them anymore. They repented. He goes, okay, now I can pay for it. Okay. I'm not angry with them. Why are you angry? Because I'm good? Watch this. When you serve Frank and Jesus, you will be so consumed by your own hurt. And he, this is legitimate hurt more than anything that you probably experience. I mean, these are like crazy probably what this guy's dealing with in this message of like, go mediate for these guys. And he says, uh, so wound up in bitterness with this other version of God that allows him to be bitter and full of hatred when God saves and when God is good. And so full of this is he, that he doesn't understand the bigger picture of this because for I think 40 years straight, every year the Assyrians go to war, every year. Every year they come into your land and rape and pillage and kill. Because God is good and God still used a flawed Jonah, what happened after this, we think historically, is that there was this period of time called the period of stagnation, where for 41 years, the Assyrians didn't go to war. If Jonah holds on to that other version and holds on to that other thing and that bitterness, his own people are killed because of it. He has even more reason to be bitter because God intended to stop it. And he just needed a Jonah. Assyria is, Nineveh is actually in today's, in Mosul, Iraq. Iraq, Syria, Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Lebanon. Peace in the Middle East. God is like, this is bigger than you. Jonah, you're going to have to pay the ticket. This is bigger than you. I need a mediator. I need you to give up your life. And if they kill you, they kill you. But I need you to go and do this thing because your own people will be saved if you do it. But the trouble is he asks you for that before you have any guarantees. And I wish that Jonah would have joined Nineveh because this is the trick here. Because they wrestled a bunch of cats into potato sacks. And you can't do that and be proud and self-righteous and angry at the same time. You ever try to wrestle a cat into anything? 
What does that look like, Pastor? So write the letter that you've been. Make the phone call you need to make. Apologize. Tell somebody the truth. Do the hard thing. Wrestle the cat into a sack. Because our repentance and our willingness to mediate is going to change the lives of the people around us.